as dawn broke, he arose. Jesus was coming for his kingdom. Coming to save man from sin. Coming to crush the hold of death from within. Coming so man could live with him forever. But man's heart did not desire his saving grace. He came humbly on the unbroken foal of a donkey. As he entered the city, the people rejoiced, but Jesus wept. You see, the crowds didn't want forgiveness and mercy. They desired an earthly victory. They followed Jesus for misguided reasons. They followed his works, but denied the freedom in his words. He came for a spiritual kingdom, not of earth, but the kingdom of heaven. And though legions of angels knelt before him, he did not come to wage war on the Romans, but to wage war on religion. That cancerous hypocrisy driven by pride, which concluded that the sinner should be shamed and excluded. But these very sinners were the purpose of his crucifixion. Make no mistake, Jesus did not die a victim. He was instead the willing sacrifice for our sin. We worship Jesus today, not because of what he may do for us, but because of who he is to us, our King, our Messiah, and our God, who brought his kingdom through a cross, the heavy cross that pointed to a promise, a revelation, that one day we'll stand with every nation, tribe, and language. Palm branches lifted high, one voice united in a deafening cry. Salvation belongs to our God. Jesus is here. His kingdom is here. My name is Kevin Wilson. I'm so glad to be with you this morning. The Bible says that God is doing a new thing. He's doing a new thing. That's what it says in Isaiah 43. I don't know about you, but I need a new thing every morning, especially before coffee. I need a new thing. I need new energy, new vision, sometimes new grace, new forgiveness. And I just want to say, Wherever you are this morning, I believe God wants to speak to you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to meet you. For some, he wants to touch and and heal where we have wounds. He wants to help us understand who we were, who we can be, and how to get there. And, And I believe today he's going to communicate some practical steps to do that. So I'm excited today. You are prayed for, our service is prayed for, and I want to say welcome to those of you who are streaming in or watching our recording. Uh, We love you as well. You are a part of us, and I believe that God will speak through the internet, through the recording, through these microphones, through limited me, finite me. It's crazy. It's crazy to me. But I just want to pray for us and then just get ready. We're going to say good morning to somebody. So just, uh, just prepare yourselves. Please pray with me. God, we thank you for this day. Thank you that we could come together to experience you, to hear from your word, to receive practical guidance for our lives, to hear how you feel about us, your creation your people. Help us, Lord, to be open, to hear. Some of us, Lord, are distracted. We've got real-life stuff going on that's competing for our attention. Help us, Lord, to hear from you, to receive it, and to take a step, to take a risky step of faith towards you. We need you, God. We need you. It's in your name we pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right, I'm going to invite us to say hi to somebody. If you're not sure exactly what to say, I'll just, 
I'll just give you an idea. Just say something like, you look good today. All right? It's just an idea. It's just an idea. You may not feel it. It's not all about warm, fuzzy feelings. But I just encourage you to just say it. You look good today. You look good. All right. All right. Thank you. But every place I turn for heat left me more broken than the land. Take me back to the place that feels like home. To the people I can depend on. You can go ahead and stay standing after you tell someone they look good today. Go ahead and stay standing, and we'll go right into our worship.
Amen. Please be seated. We're just happy that you're worshiping with us today. Um, there are two cards. There's a welcome home if you're a visitor with us today that you can fill out. And then also a written prayer request. So sometimes, even though the Lord knows what's on your heart, it's hard to verbalize it. So if it's easier for you to write it down, you could put it in the offering plates whenever we get to that portion. And we have a board meeting after church today following service. And we had a wonderful time with all of our kiddos at the Easter egg hunt yesterday. So a special thank you to all those who helped get everything prepped and volunteered their time with that. And Easter service is next Sunday where we will be also witnessing four different baptisms. So remember to invite your friends and family to spend that amazing morning with us. And also be sure to download the WSCC and FLC Church Center app. And you can also scan the QR code that will be on the screen after our fun little photos from our hunt. Um, so that way you can stay plugged in with everything that's happening down here. And Pastor Kevin's Accelerate class um, will take a break this week due to the board meeting as well as Easter Sunday next week. So then we'll pick back up in three weeks then. And starting back on April 1st, there's a women's small group that meets on Monday evenings at 6 o'clock down here. And every second and fourth Thursday mornings at 10, we have a ladies' Bible study, so that will be this Thursday coming up. As well, on Thursday night, we have a men's Bible study at 6.30 and a virtual men's marriage recovery class that Pastor Kevin leads. Um, so there's contact info sheets on the table out in the foyer that has a little snippet and who you need to plug in with if you're interested in any of those. So that's everything I have for you. If you guys will please play with me today. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for everybody who made it here to us in person or those who are plugging in online. We're just so thankful to have them here, Lord. And be with us on this beautiful Palm Sunday as we prepare our hearts and our minds for Kevin's message today, as well as just getting ready for Easter next week, Lord, and what beautiful, beautiful day that will be. So be with us as we continue our week and just bring us back here safely next week. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I just want to highlight that um, we really do love kids and uh, and families. We we love you know uh, every demographic, but I just want to say uh, you really missed out uh, if you weren't at the Easter egg hunt. I mean, I got uh, quite a few eggs uh, before the kids were able to get to them. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, so um, anyway, no, seriously though, that's a joke. Uh, seriously though, um, we do value um, all of our people and especially our kids because Jesus loves children. I mean, the disciples, the disciples said, you know, Jesus is way too important for these kids and, and it's so beautiful. Jesus says, no, you don't understand me. You must not know me. Um, I love children, bring them to me. It is not a waste of time it is a beautiful thing and so if you see me laughing and you know um, you know just enjoying the kids I just want to say they they get it I think understanding Jesus and spirituality in so many ways is easier for kids mm -hmm. like they come in and they just know who loves them and they're just you know they're just drawn to people that love them and having fun and so one thing I want to uh, highlight we do a lot of things here at, at Westside Christian. I mean, we've got people that are involved in all kinds of things. And one thing I want to highlight is um, we have uh, several Boy Scout and Cub Scout families. And I just want to, I want to highlight uh, Chad and Michelle Offerman and their, their work with their kids. Uh, and, I, and I'm not going to call them up or ask them to stand, but I just want to say Carson recently uh, was rewarded the God and Me pin 
And I just think that's awesome. And I, is he, he probably already went back with the kids. Well, um, if you get a chance to tell Carson, great job. Uh, and you guys are doing a great job because whether it's Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts or coaching or just getting them fed and in bed, listen, that's hard work. <laughs> that is holy work. It really is, guys. Let's give them and, and others a hand. Parenting is, it really is hard. It is, it is so hard. I have four children myself, and so much of parenting is, you know, nobody sees your hard work of getting up early and uh, helping them get on the bus, you know, uh, keeping them alive. I, I heard, I felt better when James, I heard James Dobson say, just keep boys alive until they're 11. It's good, that's a good bar. It's a, it's a good bar to have. Um, but seriously, um, yeah, God is, God is working with us. And I just want to pray a blessing over uh, parents real mm -hmm. quick. God, we do just lift up our parents. And we, we pray for sleep when it's time to sleep. We pray for energy, wisdom, discernment. God, I just pray for encouragement for people who are feeling burdened and exhausted. Help us, Lord. I pray especially for single parents. I pray for those who are struggling in their marriage. I pray that they'd have time for date nights and laughter and just to feel your pleasure over them, that you are proud of them, that you love them. Help us to help them. And Lord, we just thank you. Thank you that you see us, that you love all of us. It's in your name we pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As a part of our worship, I just want to invite us to give back to God through tithes and offerings. It's just really a privilege to be able to give back to God and know that he's going to continue to bless us because he blesses us to be a blessing to others. That's what it's all about. Um, it's not like the Dead Sea where there's no outlet. He blesses us to just keep giving and keep pouring out into others. And so that's really what the offering time is about. So I just want to invite Thank you guys for um, passing those plates around. You can give online, you can give in the plate, put your prayer uh, cards in there, your contact cards if you have them. And uh, we're gonna sing this song, uh, Dancing on the Waves together as a part of our offering. So we just invite you to stay seated during this time and feel free to sing, but especially receive these words over you about God's love for you and your identity in him.
God, would you help us? Help us to identify what step you want us to take. Some of us, you're calling to get in the boat with you. You're in the boat or to allow you to get into the boat. Some of us, you are calling to get out of the boat and walk on the water and trust you. Help us, Lord. Help us to step into it. Mm -hmm. To keep our eyes fixed on you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. 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 I'm going to read this passage of scripture. If you have um, a Bible, I invite you to open up to... John chapter 12, we're going to look at um, a little chunk in John 12 and a passage in John 13, and you can follow along on the screen as well if you want. Um, Today's Palm Sunday, Uh, many of you know that, Um, the church has been decorated beautifully, it was always one of my favorite holidays as a kid simply because it was a little bit of Florida that came into church and made it less boring for me as a kid. (laughs) So the palm branches, what's up with the palm branches? We'll talk about that today. I think it's it's really a beautiful thing, but John 12, verses 12 to 15. John 12, verses 12 to 15. It says, the next day, the great, I'm sorry, my microphone just came off. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it. As it is written, do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And then if you look forward to John chapter 13, we're going to look at verses 1 through 17. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. You are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. This is God's word. We're going to sing this song, O Come to the Altar. It's really just to prepare our hearts and minds for what God wants to say to us. 
So we just invite you to start by standing uh, if you're able. I mean, it's not unspiritual to sit, but we invite you to stand and sing the song. And, and as much as we're able with our will, let's open up our hearts to what God would say to us through this passage. <laughs>
Again, my name is Kevin. I'm glad to be with you today. Uh, today we're going to look at um, these passages of Scripture, and we're just going to ask some really basic questions. I mean, it's how to read and understand any book, really. People ask me all the time, how do you understand the Bible? How do you apply it? And uh, it's, it's really a basic process of first asking, what does it say? You know, what today we're going to look at Jesus doing these things. What does Jesus do? What did it mean in their culture 2,000 years ago? What did it mean and what does it mean today? That's, that's basically the heart of any biblical sermon or any biblical Bible study. You're going to ask that question. What does it say? Let's make some observations. What did it mean and what does it mean today? Um, again, this is uh, Palm Sunday, and I'm very excited about this because this is actually one of the most un misunderstood passages in Scripture, and I don't think it has to be. It doesn't need to be. So today, part of what I want to do is help us really build a bridge so what's actually going on uh, in this Palm Sunday scene and what it means for us today. Um, so again, we're going to start in John 12, the, um, the, the Palm Sunday passage. Um, so many people, whether they consider themselves Christians or not, they know this scene. Jesus riding a donkey into town. And so many people um, read this through the lens of our culture, right? And in our culture, first of all, I've got some horse lovers here, my horse people. I love you guys. I'm with you. Grew up with horses as well. So we have horse lovers, but it's actually, just think it's not as common in our world today as it was, you know, 70, 80, 100 years ago for people to understand horses. Well, even in our culture today, it's so much less common to... to be around a donkey or a mule. And so we automatically think in our culture, oh yeah, a donkey is an awkward kind of animal. You know, it's, it's like it, once it's a poor man's horse. You know, that's, that's what we think is it's, it's awkward, it's kind of weird, it's kind of goofy, it makes a funny sound. You know, so we think, oh, Jesus was... He was being humble by riding this donkey into town. He was demonstrating his humility. And would you believe it's actually the opposite? And I thought this, this set of pictures may help. If, if you could bring up the, the first car, the Pinto. The, the I just did a little layman's research, really, on cars. And I just asked kind of what is kind of known to be, if this is offensive to you, like, please don't take it personally. I, you know, when, when you're 16, you'll take any car, right? But I did this research on, like, what is understood to be, like, the worst car in American history? It's the 1971 Pinto. Yes, it was. <laughs> That's what we think Jesus was riding into town on, okay? Just imagine if somebody took kind of a hacksaw and opened up the roof and made it, you know, a 1971, you know, um, with Jesus standing out and, and he's standing out while somebody's riding the Pinto into town. That's what we think he's doing. Actually, actually, I submit to you that culturally what's happening is Jesus is driving one of these. This is the 1932 Cadillac. You may have seen it from the Mafia movies. This is the V16 1932 Cadillac, which is also understood, just a little layman's research, to be the best car, you know, in American history. And actually, we read the Palm Sunday story as though Jesus is driving some kind of clown car into town, and Jesus is humiliating himself because he's riding a donkey. And in ancient Near Eastern culture, Actually, and if you just hang with me for a second, I think you'll see this. When people rode donkeys, it was a statement of really kingship. Kings rode donkeys rather than war horses. 
And, uh, and it's really clear, I think an interesting example of this in, is in 1 Kings 1, starting in verse 33, when King David is anointing his son Solomon as king, here's what he says. <clears throat> Put him on my donkey. Put him on my donkey and let's, let's anoint him. Listen to this. It says, King David said, Call in Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah, son of Jehoiada. When they came before the king, he said to them, Take your Lord's servants with you and set Solomon, my son, on my own donkey. Take him down to, to Gihon. There have Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, anoint him king over Israel. Blow the trumpet and shout, Long live King Solomon. Then you are to go up with him. He is to come and sit on my throne and reign in my place. I, haven't, I have appointed him ruler over Israel and Judah. In other words, King David is saying, Solomon is king. And the Jewish people know. What do you do with kings? You put them on a donkey and have them ride into town. Why? Why is that? Because war generals and war officers ride war horses into town because there's a battle to be fought. Kings who have power don't need to fight any battles. They ride into town and the battle is won. They are riding on a gentle, meek donkey. We're going to see in this passage that real power when people have power, they do not need to be defensive. They do not need to fight. They do not need to tell everybody how powerful they are. So Jesus is riding a donkey, declaring, really, by action, his kingship over this city. And that's actually what they're saying to him in these statements. Hosanna means save us. The palm branches was their form of a red carpet. It was a ticker tape parade. They were declaring that Jesus is our king. He's the king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're saying he's the Messiah. He is God's representative. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey, sat on it. As it is written, verse 15, <clears throat> Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. But what kind of king is Jesus? That's what, that's what we're going to ask. So if Jesus is riding in on a V16 Cadillac and he's saying, I am the king, it is appropriate for you to worship me. It is appropriate for you to put down red carpet for me. What does that mean? mean for us? Or I'll ask it this way, what kind of king is he? Because what did kings do, or what do kings do, you know, in our culture today? Kings subdue others. Kings typically abuse their power. Kings threaten, you know, you either submit to me or I kill you. That's world history. That's what kings do, but Jesus is not that kind of king. So what kind of king is he? And I just want to pause here for a second, and I want to acknowledge, for some of you who are listening this morning, you would say Jesus is your Lord and your king. What kind of king is he? Have you surrendered to him? Because that's that's a part of his kingship. It is surrendering your life, your will, your ugly parts, the things you think nobody knows about. It is surrendering to this king. What kind of king is he? And we're going to look at this passage in John 13 as Jesus demonstrates what kind of king he is. He's different than any other king in world history. I'll just say that. He is a different kind of king, so much that even his own family did not understand when he started to proclaim to be the Messiah. He, even his own family said, he's out of his mind. And certainly the disciples didn't understand it. They thought he was the kind of king that was going to overthrow Rome. 
He was going to build a new temple. And, and no, that's not the kind of king that he is. So what kind of king is he? Well, look with me in John 13, and we're going to see what kind of king he is and what it means for us. <clears throat> it says in verse 1, it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. What kind of king will go to any measure to demonstrate the full extent of his love? He does not have subjects. He has Friends, he tells his friends everything. He, he loves his people and he wants to show the full extent of his love. I think that's interesting. He's going to show in this little vignette, he's going to show the full extent of his love and it's not even the cross yet. It says what he's about to do is to demonstrate the full extent of his love. This king wants his people to know how much he loves them and how much he loves others. And I just want to ask, do you know him? He's a different kind of king. He does not force his way onto us. He invites. He invites us to come to him. He calls us to come to him and be set free. Let's look <clears throat> at what he does, uh, because I think it's, it's really interesting, and God has a lot to say to us through this passage. In a phrase, what does he do? He washes the disciples' feet. He washes their feet, but what does that mean? What does that mean? Let me just... Uh, Read it again, starting in verse 4. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Well, it's certainly difficult for us to understand culturally what he's doing and what it meant to them. One of the reasons is because um, we have amazing shoes, amazing sneakers. I'm a shoe person. I, mean, I love Nike and Reebok when they came out in the 80s, you know, Adidas. We have these great shoes that protect our feet, that keep them clean. But I just want to say, if there were a pole in world history, in the entire world, I believe the most disgusting part of the human body would be the feet. I can vouch for this. Anybody else that goes to the YMCA, I just want to say there should be foot police or some kind of, there's money to be made, some kind of assessment system that an alarm goes off if there's a person with disgusting feet who are allowing those feet to touch the bare floor. I did campus ministry for over 15 years, and I tell you, honestly, the, the hardest part for me was not the skeptics. It was not the angry atheists. It was going into Hale Hall every Thursday night at the University of Evansville where the freshman men reside. Only men. Only men, of course. And every time I went in there just being smacked in the face with the smell of feet and Doritos. And they always go together. Feet and Doritos. If you're around teenage boys, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. <laughs> In their culture, they wore open-toed sandals all the time. It was dusty. It was dirty. They walked everywhere. And there is animal manure everywhere in the streets. So when they went in someone's house, it was normal for them to first wash their feet. So what's going on here in this passage? I believe we can understand by saying this, and my dog Loki, uh, if you don't know Loki, he's a, he's a cartoon character, he's, he's, but he's for real. He's a 100-pound chocolate labradoodle. And let me tell you, it is a full-body workout to try to trim his toenails. 
Even my dog will not let someone touch his feet without force. What about you? Have you ever let anyone trim your toenails? What about you? I mean, I know some of you ladies, you go and you go to the spa and you get the full works. That's great. But I, as for me, I, I don't know if I could trust someone that much. This is really what Jesus is doing is he's modeling for them that he has come to cleanse them, not just of the, you know, the nice and neat parts of their body, their hands and the figuratively their hearts, but he's come to go to those areas in their lives that they're ashamed of. Those areas that they think nobody knows about. And Jesus is bringing salvation fundamentally to the parts of his disciples that um, they would not you know, easily release to God. I believe Jesus here is demonstrating that he came he came to save us from the really dirty parts, the really ugly parts of ourselves. Have you surrendered those parts to him? Because I believe what Jesus is demonstrating in this passage is that he came to heal us from those parts that we think are too gross even for God. And Jesus clearly says to us, just like he says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come and bring those parts that we're ashamed of, that we're even afraid of. And Jesus here is coming to save us from guilt and shame and fear. He's come to heal us from hiding I do think it's interesting, by the way, that John here notes multiple times <clears throat> this was not just the disciples, you know, that were with Jesus. This also included Judas. Judas had already decided to betray Jesus. And multiple times, John makes it clear that, that Jesus is washing Judas' feet. He washes all 12 of them. And I think it's interesting here that Peter certainly doesn't understand what's happening. And so he says, Jesus, no, do not touch my feet. His feet must have really been gross for him to say, no, Jesus, not my feet. I think it's interesting. Some of us this morning might identify with Judas, that you feel like a hypocrite. Maybe this week you failed in some area. Maybe you feel like, God certainly is not happy with me. And I think it's interesting here that Jesus invites Judas to relationship as well. He offers salvation to Judas. He washes his feet just like he does the others. And here, Peter, maybe some of us identify with Peter and we say, oh no, not that part of my life. Wherever you are this morning, Whatever you've experienced, whatever you've done, this is a great scandal of Christianity. It is available to all people, no matter what you've done, no matter what you have failed to do. Maybe today is the first time in five years that you've stepped inside a church. Guess what? It's okay. Jesus offers to every one of us salvation through him. It's about relationship with him. There's nothing that we could do or fail to do as long as we go to him and allow him to cleanse us and heal us. But I think it's fascinating that it doesn't stop there. Being a Christian, being a disciple does not stop there. We are not just patients in this hospital where Jesus is the healer. He actually transforms us if we're willing. He transforms us into under-shepherds or doctors under him as well. It's, it's amazing. It's astounding. Look with me here at John 13, verse 12. Here's what it says. When he had finished washing their feet, 
He put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. What Jesus is saying here is really astounding. First of all, salvation is about relationship with Jesus, and that's it. It is in Christ alone, by faith alone, according to the word of God alone. That's it. We are saved by grace through faith. There is nothing else that is needed to experience salvation. But he doesn't leave us there. He turns us into missionaries. He turns us into disciples. And if I can use this metaphor, he shows that we're not just patients that have come to this hospital to get well. It's also a medical school. He turns us into doctors. That's what disciples are through the power of Jesus. We are, as Henry Nouwen says, we are wounded healers. That's what it means to be a disciple now. Once Jesus washes your feet, now as Jesus says, go and do likewise. Now you understand. Help people come to me. That's what Jesus is saying. Help people follow him. Wash their feet. Do the humiliating thing now. Disciples humble themselves, roll up their shirt sleeves, and jump into the mess. We don't stay back and just stay in our ivory towers and say, oh yeah, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Mm, I hope Jesus comes back soon. That's not the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is to wash the disgusting feet to get in there and to be incarnational, to go to those places that stink, that smell, where people are making bad decisions and lead them to Christ and then help them to be disciples so they can lead others to Christ as well. It's not just a classroom where we just memorize more scripture and read and somehow we have all this information in our brains and somehow that, that changes our identity to, to be more like Jesus. It's not just that. It's Ezekiel 36. It's, he takes our hearts of stone and turns them into hearts of flesh. It's what Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2. He renews our minds. He renews our thinking so that we become more like him. That's what disciples are. It's not just a classroom. It's, it's a hospital. It's a medical school. It's a, it's a spiritual army against the kingdom of darkness. That's what we're doing. And, and you might be right there with me today saying, but how do I do this, Kevin? Like, I want to... I'm a Christian and I, I receive Jesus. How do I do this? Do I just say these words? Do I just, do I just read the Bible more and then all of a sudden, you know, I will be more and more powerful? And I say, Bible reading is important. We've got to nourish ourselves with God's word. We've got to be renewed. We have to have a relationship with the Father, Son, and Spirit as he washes away lies. We've got to replace those lies with truth and disciplines, and habits. But to the question, so many people ask me, how can I grow? I want to grow spiritually. I believe it's right here in this passage. How can I do this? I believe it's right here in this passage. And in a phrase, it's Jesus knew who he was. It is meditating on and internalizing this new identity, this identity that is in Jesus. Jesus knew who he was. It's amazing. Look with me here at the beginning of this passage, verses 2 and 3. How is it? 
that Jesus was able to face Gethsemane and the cross, how is it that he was able to empty himself somehow? He emptied himself of his rights, as it says in Philippians 2. He emptied himself knowing that God himself, the Father, was going to raise him up. This is how he faced it. It's the same invitation to us. John 13, starting in verse 2, says this, The evening meal was being served. The devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew. What did he know? Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. That's the key. Jesus knew who he was. He knew the name that was on his back. He knew his identity, so he was able to face any suffering, any humility. He knew who he was, guys. What are you talking about, Kevin? And I'll just, I'll put it this way. Those of you here on the west side of Evansville, and it's okay if you're not from the west side, the west side of Evansville really loves high school football. Whether you are a rights fan or a modern day fan. We really love our high school football. And I know this. When Wrights is playing poorly for some reason, it's, it's, let's say they're not hustling. <laughs> they're not hustling. They're not working hard. I will guarantee you, I know the culture, what the coaches say to their players. Be who you are. Be who you are. It's the exact same thing they say over at the other school. And I didn't really learn what modern day wrestling was all about until my junior year. I was wrestling this kid from Central. And I pinned him in about two minutes. And Mike Gable was furious with me. He was furious with me because I did not pin him in under a minute. And he said... Be who you are. Don't those letters mean anything to you? And I'm not here to illustrate West Side Sports because we can unpack that. We can do some unpacking with that. But I think it's important here that Jesus knew who he was. That's how he was able to do these hard things. He knew his identity. There is a disciple maker that I really love. His name is Neil Anderson. He's written several books, but one of the most influential books in my life is called Victory Over the Darkness. And basically people came to Neil Anderson and said, I want to grow in spiritual things. I have these bad habits. How can I get rid of these bad habits? Do I just be more religious do I need to just learn more prayers, memorize more prayers, memorize more scripture? And Neil Anderson said this, that no. Once he identified that it was about understanding our identity in Christ, that's when life change really started to happen for people. I believe one of Satan's strategies is to lie to us about who we are. He wants us to live into who we were. He wants us to live into who this world tells us we are rather than who we are in Christ. Let me just give you an idea of some of the things, and this is from his book, Victory Over the Darkness, and we're going to read these statements that are completely biblical, and yet it's going to sound almost... It's going to sound too good to be true. It's going to sound arrogant, these truths about who we are if we are in Jesus. It's going to sound arrogant, guys, but it's true. And I believe Jesus knew these things. So could we put those, those slides up for us, Matt? Who am I? I'm the salt of the earth. Like, we get that. That's from the Sermon on the Mount. That's pretty tame. Who am I? I'm the light of the world if you're a Christian from Matthew 5.14. I'm a child of God. John 1.12, if you're in Christ, 
You are a child of God. Your DNA has changed. You are not just the child of your biological parents. You are now a child of God. Biblical. I'm part of the true vine, a channel of Christ's life. I am Christ's friend. I am chosen and appointed by Christ to bear his fruit. I am a slave of righteousness. If you are in Christ, you can't help but produce good fruit because you are a slave now of his. It's, it's not any slavery that's a negative thing. It's a beautiful thing. I'm a temple, a dwelling place of God. His spirit and his life dwell in me. I am united to the Lord and am one spirit with him. I'm a member of Christ's body. I'm a new creation. Do you know that? If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. That's what 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says. You are new. The old has gone. The new has come. Satan wants you to live into the old, but you are a new person, capable of new things. The next line from 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and following, I'm reconciled to God, a minister of reconciliation. I'm a, a son of God and one in Christ. You are Jesus' brother through him. You have a new relationship with the Father. He's our Savior, but he is also our brother. He's the firstborn of those who have new life, eternal life in him. I am an heir of God. I am God's workmanship. I'm a fellow citizen with the rest of God's family. I'm a prisoner of Christ. I am righteous and holy. I'm a citizen of heaven, seated in heaven right now. I'm hidden with Christ in God. Chosen of God, I'm holy and dearly loved. I'm a son or daughter of light and not of darkness. I'm a holy partaker of a heavenly calling. I'm a partaker of Christ. I share in his life. I'm one of God's living stones being built up in Christ as a spiritual house. We could go on and on, guys. But how is it that Jesus did hard things? He knew who he was. He knew his identity. And he says of us, that's who we are now. We are connected to God through him. He says of those who are disciples, you will do greater things than me. You will do greater things. He demonstrates to us what it means to be fully human. We lower our bar and we say, yeah, but don't you know who I was? Don't you know the things I struggle with? And God's word says, no, that's not who you are now. That's who you were. So there are two invitations I want to say today, really simple. Some of us have not yet let Jesus wash our feet. It may be scary. It may be uncomfortable, but I promise you, Jesus does not want to and will not hurt you. He will not shame you. He wants to set you free. That's what he does. He wants you to be the best version of yourself that you can possibly be. The things that you love, he wants to enhance and use it for good and loving others. He's not going to take those things away from you. He's going to set you free even more to do those things and to be that person. That's one invitation, is to come to him and trust him and let him wash your feet. And number two, if you do consider yourself a Christian, I believe he's calling us to help other people experience that freedom, to be involved in other people's lives, even though maybe culturally it doesn't seem nice, it's gross, it smells bad, it's difficult, it's frustrating. That's what it means to be a disciple. It's, to, it's just to help other people. It doesn't mean shaming them or guilting them or beating them over the head with scripture they don't understand. It's, it's loving them. It's walking with them. That's really what discipleship is. And as we read the New Testament, the disciples finally got it that it's about partnering with Jesus and loving difficult people through it.
So please pray with me. And I invite the worship team to come up. God, would you help us to surrender? Would you help us to get right with you and to not hold anything back, to bring it into your presence, especially this week? Help us to trust the full extent of your love because you are a different kind of king. You do not subdue and force your way onto people. You invite You invite us to come. Help us to come. And others of us, Lord, help us to serve. Help us to see people around us who are spiritually broken and dirty and struggling. Help us to look past the things the culture tells us to do. Help us to look past who we were and see who we are and who we can be. God, thank you. Thank you for this privilege that we get to be in relationship with you. Help us to do our part and take steps to do that. It's in your name we pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to invite you, if you're able, to stand. And we're going to sing one more song, and it's it's called Rescue Story. And this may be your story. If not, I just invite you to read it and listen to it and hear God's invitation. He wants all of us to be rescued and empowered. Fighting my battles for me. You are my rescue. Story. 
story Lifting me up from the ashes Carrying my soul from death to life Bringing me from glory to glory You are my rescue story You are, you are You are my rescue story You are, you are God, help us to trust you. Help us to see you as you really are and to see ourselves as we really are. Mm -hmm. Help us, Lord, to trust you, to hear your voice, to know that it's good, that you have good plans for us, plans to prosper us and not to harm us, plans to give us hope and a future. We give it all to you. It's in your name we pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Have a great day, guys. 